Chapter 6. Afraid of Nothing Gilgamesh meant never to die. Having seen death at close quarters, he knew that it was not for him. It made a nonsense of all endeavor, made fame worthless, made achievements hollow. No, he would oversee Enkidu's funeral, then leave Uruk. It held nothing for him now, and go in search of the secret. What secret? What is it you want to know? His mother asked, alarmed by the unkempt wildness of her son and the look in his eye of sheer madness. The secret of immortality, of course, said Gilgamesh. What I have to do, where I have to go to live forever. Oh, but Gilgamesh, son! Nin Sun sat down, her hands in her lap. No one lives forever. Death comes to all in the end. It is just a matter of how. That's not true! Nin Sun was alarmed. Her son's voice was so strident. He grabbed her by the wrist and dragged her through the palace yards and gardens to where a frieze decorated one of the great walls. As a child, Gilgamesh had sat and gazed at it for hours. It was his favorite story, of the flood and the man who saved the world from ending. The boat riding on the flood waters was just a square, a simple box, and on top of it stood a man, hands upraised. He didn't die! Gilgamesh jabbed a finger at the sailor on the frieze. Utnapishtim was granted immortality by the gods. If they can grant it to him, they can grant it to me. All I have to do is find Utnapishtim and ask him the secret. Ninsun trembled for her son. The death of his friend had driven him to desperation. He was not eating, not washing, not sleeping. Already his handsome face had aged ten years. She put out a hand to touch his cheek, but she might as well have reached out for a bird. He broke away from her and was gone, a wild, disheveled creature running away. Gilgamesh! Son! Come back! Where are you going? Come back! The king of Uruk ran out into the wilderness. Soon his hair, once so curled and glossy, hung in a dusty, matted mass down his back, past his waist, and his kingly robes were ragged. He drank at the same muddy waterholes as gazelles and hogs. He asked the beasts and the bushes and the trees, Where can I find Utnapishtim? But they did not answer. The trees only put their heads together and whispered. He despised them. They lived and died without a struggle. He envied them. Each spring they came back to life. Not Enkidu. He would never come back. He did not stop to eat. In the stony wilderness there was precious little food to be had anyway, and he was always thirsty. The fat melted off him like sacrificial butter, leaving his shanks thin, his wrists and ankle bones looking overlarge. In the daytime the sun burned him raw, and sweat trickled down his hair in droplets. By night the cold was so terrible that blood from a cut froze before it touched the ground. But on he went, as if death were dogging his trail. At last he came within sight of the mountains of Mashu, an awesome sight to a man of the plains. So high that they pierced the sky itself, so jagged that they sawed the land from sky, they recalled memories of his earliest childhood. As a boy, his father had brought him this far on a hunting expedition. The memory even now made the hair stand up on the nape of his neck. Lions. He remembered lions. Such number of lions that the journey had been abandoned. O oh, moon god Sin! He prayed aloud, as a full moon bobbed up like a bubble from behind the mountains. Guard my sleeping hours and bring me safely through this night. He walked into the foothills until daylight failed completely. Then he climbed into a tree and slept. When he woke, it was a moment before he remembered where he was. His eyelids were gummy with dust from the plains. He rolled over and only narrowly saved himself from falling out of the tree. Beneath him, dancing and prancing, playfully wrestling and rolling on their backs in the dew, were thirty or forty lions, lionesses and cubs. Their golden bodies were lithe as river water. They glowed with health and energy absolute rulers of their sunny habitat, and Gilgamesh hated them for being so alive. He leapt out of the tree, sword drawn, teeth clenched. He caught them by their tails and smashed them one against the other, jumped and stamped on them, 
wrestled and throttled them, maddened by the joy they took in life. Afterwards he ate lion steak and replaced his city clothes with lion's pelts knotted by the paws around his neck. Now the big lifeless paws patted against his skin as he walked. It soothed him that the lively lions were dead. Beyond the foothills, the Mashu Mountains rose up, sheer and smooth as glass, a barricade between the lands of men and the garden of the gods. There was a gate, a way through. The sun itself, and sinking at night, used the gate to pass through the mountains. But Gilgamesh had not reckoned with the monsters who stood guard over the gate, the scorpion man and scorpion woman. Their heads were helmeted with smooth black scales, the eyes lost somewhere behind their flaring nostrils, the beards, both man and woman, as black as thunderclouds. Their lower bodies, balanced on crackling, scuttling legs, were invulnerable to arrows or fire or sandstorm, to the heat of the sun as it rolled past them each evening, to the cold of the darkness which followed. And arcing over his head, like a great bulbous black mace, hung the poisonous tip of a scorpion's tail. They rarely had cause to use their stings, the very sight of them sucked a man's heart flat, drained it of blood, left him whitely dead of shock. When they saw Gilgamesh striding out towards them, they were both astonished and intrigued. He must be one of the immortals, said Scorpion Man. Two parts, yes, said Scorpion Woman, but one part is human. Can you not smell it? Can you not smell flesh and blood? She called out to Gilgamesh. Halt! Who dares approach? I am looking for Utnapishtim, who they call the far away, and who lives at the place called Paradise Shore, beyond the Garden of the Gods. My name is Gilgamesh, King of Uruk, and I believe this is the way I have to go. The scorpion beings trembled, a sound like a million land crabs sloughing their shells. To do that, you would need to travel to the mountains, twelve leagues without light. What is so important that you should attempt is impossible. They noticed that Gilgamesh's feet were never still. Even now he trod water like a drowning man. Open the gate and let me through. There are things that I have to ask Utnapishtim, things no one else can tell me. The scorpion beings marveled at his perseverance. Are you not afraid, Gilgamesh? Do you know nothing of the fear that keeps your fellow men at home? We admire your courage, King of Yurik, we do, but turn back now if you love life. The expression then on Gilgamesh's face made even the scorpion beings blanch. His soul looked out at them through his eyes, and his soul was in torment. I had a friend, he told them, the best friend a man ever had. His name was Enkidu. We did everything together, but my friend died. He died, you hear? I thought that if I argued for him, I could save him. I thought that if I held him in my arms, the gods couldn't take him away. I thought that if I cried long enough, my tears would bring him back to life. But I was wrong. Enkidu is dead and gone, and thanks to him. Not afraid, did you say? I'm so afraid I don't care if scorpion men stand in my way. It's all I can do to see the path in front of me. I'm so afraid... This death has turned me into such a coward that I can't sink any lower into fear. And what good is a king who's too afraid to sit in his own city? What good is a hero eaten up with terror? The scorpion beings laid aside their weapons. They heaved open the fire-scorched gate, which had only ever opened for the sun. Pass through before nightfall, Gilgamesh of Uruk. If you do not lose your wits in the dark, you may at last reach the Garden of the Gods. And may the gods grant you an answer to your questions, or an easy death. For a while, when he looked back, Gilgamesh could see their heads silhouetted against the tunnel's entry, dark against the daylight, watching him go. But then the tunnel's entrance was out of sight, and he was plunged into the unrelieved darkness. Dark. It was not the dark of night, pricked through with stars. It was not the darkness of indoors, with candles or embers in the grate. It was not the darkness of sleep which is illuminated by moonlight, or by dreams at least. No, this was solid dark. The air was every bit as black as the rock walls to either side. No means of seeing his way forward, 
No way of knowing where the passage bent or its floor was a swarm with cockroaches. On and on Gilgamesh went, his fingers touching the wall to either side, his face pushing forwards, his eyeballs dry with staring helplessly after light. The darkness had struck him blind, and he had to feel his way, step by chilling step. When he looked back after one league, dark. When he looked forwards, dark. Inside and outside of his eyelids, dark. Filling his brain, dark. After two leagues, there was no difference, no shaft of light, no movement of air. Dark to front and back, dark inside and out, dark. After four and after five leagues, the darkness seemed to seep through his skin. He could taste, smell, see, and hear only darkness. The mountain was digesting him. After six leagues, after seven, there was still no relief. He knew what it was to be cut off from Shamash, out of touch with his god, buried alive under fathomless rock. It was almost like being dead. After eight, after nine leagues, he might as well have been born without eyes. He thought that if he were not already mad with grief, then this darkness would have done for him. After ten leagues, a breeze flowed into his face like black water. After eleven, he thought his mind must be playing tricks on him for a pinprick of light seemed to be dancing, far away, small as an ant's egg. As he felt his way forward, the pinprick grew to a circle, and through the circle strayed a few weak rays of light. Blinking and stumbling, and blinkering his eyes with both hands, he ran out of the tunnel and into... a garden. It was a garden like no other, for instead of fruit or blossoms on the trees... Jewels and precious stones bent the golden branches under their glittering weight, carnelian and agate, emeralds and peridots, zircons and opals, jet pips encased in ruby berries, lapis leaves flickering, pearls as big as snowberries, branches of coral on trees of onyx, all tinkled and twinkled amid umbelliferous flower heads of silver. Even the dew was diamantine. After the dark, the absurd magnificence dazzled Gilgamesh. He smiled despite himself, but found the muscles of his face wasted. He could only smile deadpan. Well, he thought, despite his wariness, I have come this far. If I can do that, I can do more. Then the words of his friend came back to him like stones to choke on. Do or die! No truer words. Do or die. Chapter 7. Give Up Beyond the garden was the even greater brightness of the sea. Gilgamesh stood toe to toe with the surf and stared out across the water, perplexed. The sea? He had heard of it, but never seen it. He looked around for help. Then he saw it. A seafront bar, its terrace overhung with vines. There was a wine press, too. Whoever lived there clearly grew the grapes pressed them, and fermented the wine before selling it to passers-by. What passers-by? A woman as big as an oak cask sat skimming the scum off a vat of newly pressed juice. A veil concealed all but her big, bare feet. Gilgamesh could not see her face through the veil, but she could see him. As he came into view, she straightened a little. Then, throwing down her skimmer and hoisting up her skirts, she ran for the safety of the house. He saw what she was doing and put on a sprint, but she was already inside and slamming the door. He put out one foot and wedged it in the closing gap. Siduri leaned the whole of her bulk behind the door. Gilgamesh yelped and withdrew his foot. The woman managed to pin the door shut with her great weight. Go away, whoever you are! Gilgamesh put his mouth close to the door and bellowed, Let me in or I'll smash in your walls and kick your wine press into the sea. I am Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, slayer of Huwawa, and the bull of heaven. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Not. Am. Not. I've heard of Gilgamesh, she panted back through the door. And he's young and handsome, and all the women of Uruk swoon after him with his big dark eyes and curly hair. And you come along telling me you're Gilgamesh? You, 
You, you old candlewick! Gilgamesh was taken aback. He stepped away from the door, and Siduri, who had been pushing on it with all her weight, spilled out of doors at his feet. But she was unrepentant. Look at you, she said. You look one hundred and four, and as if you'd seen all the trouble of the world. Look as if you've walked half the world and slept out in the weathers without so much as a hat. All skin and bone and worry, that's you, she said accusingly. Call yourself Gilgamesh of Uruk. I am. Not. Am. Not. Am. Look at yourself. So Gilgamesh did look into a bowl of skimmed grape juice, and even he doubted that the reflection looking back at him was Gilgamesh of Uruk. His cheeks were hollow, his eyes sunken into their sockets, his lips blistered by heat and chapped by cold. His beard was matted with filth, and his hair had turned snow white. He slapped the reflection into fragments. Why shouldn't I be changed, he said. I've traveled half the world, and I've had troubles. You wouldn't understand. How could a woman understand? I had a friend, the best friend a man could have. His name was Enkidu, and I loved him. Now he's dead. I've just walked through twelve leagues of darkness, and unless I can find Utnapishtim the far away, I shall die just like Enkidu. Isn't that grief enough to change a man? During the wild and furious lament, Siduri had got to her feet and busied about writing tables and polishing a cup on her veil. Sit down and have a drink, she said cozily. A few raisins, look, some good fresh bread. I, I baked it this morning. She hummed tunelessly and threw a rock at a seagull stealing sardines from the drying rack. Gradually Gilgamesh grew calmer and dried his tears with one paw of his lion skin. Tell me how I can find Utnapishtim, woman he said. Get wash first, and have a bite to eat. It can't be had, you know. What can't? This immortality thing. She went and filled a beaker with seawater to throw at the skinny cats basking on her roof. When the gods made us, they never meant us to last, no more than a loaf of bread or a chicken's egg. We was meant to grow, grow up, grow old, and fall off the twig. You know what you ought to do. Find the paradise shore, not sit here wasting time. Give up, my dear. Eat, drink, and be merry. Did you never hear that? Eat, drink, and be merry. Oh, I can recommend it. Honey cakes for breakfast, freshly grilled sardines for lunch, milk and pobs after a supper of eggs, melon. Now what did the gods ever invent that was better than a melon, eh? Except two melons. Lobster. Ooh, who needs paradise? You're a long time dead. There's another true thing for you. You're a long time dead. Grab the day and run with it. What you ought to do is get married. Children, that's the shape of happiness. A little hand inside yours. Someone riding high up on your shoulders, laughing out loud. Friends, yes, but a good wife takes some bettering. Cherries in bed. Someone to sit with in the shade. Someone who can weather you even when you're sour as a lemon. Someone who thinks all your jokes are funny. Someone who knows what you like to eat after a hard day's... whatever it is a king does. Someone who thinks you're as much a hero for killing a cockroach as a dragon. Get married and have children. That's the way we foil the gods. I mean, what good would it do to live a million years unhappy? The cats came coiling and moiling back to their favorite spot. Keep your advice for your customers. Just tell me where I can find Utnapishtim. Siduri sucked in air through her teeth, so that her veil puckered against her mouth. Oh, now he lives over the water. To the side of the waters of death. And no one crosses over there but Urshanabi, the ferryman. He fetches and carries things over to Paradise Shore. You could always ask him, but he won't take you anyway. Against his terms of employment, see? Be better off giving up and going home. Seems to me it's the quality of life that matters, not how long it drags on. Shoo! Siduri lunged at the cats, flapping her skirts, sending them yowling and hissing down the beach. When she turned, Gilgamesh had gone. Siduri chose herself the fattest sardine, poured herself a cup of wine, and with her feet resting in the water bucket, ate lunch, flinging the fish heads and tails to the cats and the seagulls, as they had known very well she would. She did it every day.
ocean. The edge of all geography, the margin of the known world. Out there, what monsters lurked under the brittle glass roof of moving water. Gilgamesh's fright fueled a spitting, ungovernable anger even he did not understand. Suddenly he saw it, bobbing on turquoise shallows amid the pincushioned pines, the ferry to Paradise Shore. The ferryman was applying a coat of paint to the snake-headed prow. Well, thought Gilgamesh, if it had to be done, he would do it as he had always done things, with heroic violence. He would capture this boat, as he had captured the cities of the plains. So opening his mouth and emptying his mind, Gilgamesh ran down out of the trees, hollering and yelling and dragging his sword point through the noisy pebbles. He hurtled up to his knees in the water and began smashing at the boat's stern. Over and over again he hacked at the pegs and pulley and cleats and magic symbols. Out of the corner of his eye he was aware of the ferryman gaping at him. Missing his footing, Gilgamesh slipped on a weed-covered stone and sat down with a splash. The ferryman threw his paintbrush in the air. Now what did you want to go and do that for? You have to take me over to Paradise Shore, Gilgamesh demanded. You have to take me to Utnapishtim the far away. Urshanabi covered his eyes with one hand. You've made good and sure I don't, haven't you? You just smashed the steering gear and the magic that drives her where the wind don't. Gilgamesh felt suddenly rather small. He pulled himself to his feet and declared that being a king gave him the right to smash boats as and when he saw fit. I am Gilgamesh of Uruk, slayer of Huwawa and the Bull of Heaven. And you must have fallen on hard times, said the ferryman. I heard you were young and too full of life for your own good, and here you are, looking like the bones left on a gutting table after the catch has landed. What happened to you? So Gilgamesh told him. I had a friend. His name was Enkidu. When the gods decreed he must die, I was made to look death in the face, and the sight terrified me. Terrified. I can't die like that. I can't die. Utnapishtim didn't. So he can tell me the secret of immortality. Little by little, the slopping sea washed all the bluster and aggression out of Gilgamesh, and he was left explaining himself, excusing himself. Don't be angry with me, ferryman. You go there every day. All I'm asking is that you take me there once. Urshanabi shook his big, sunburned head and skipped a stone over the waves. You ask more than you know, but since the steering gear is smashed... I'll need you to cut twelve good long poles of wood from the tallest trees you can find. Then whittle and ream them so they slot together end to end. Can you do that? Can kings turn their hands to such work? Thing is, man of Uruk, the crossing takes us over the river of death. If you or I so much as dip one finger into that water, or splash ourselves with its spray, we'll discover all the secrets of mortality there and then, quicker than it was meant. Humbled, Gilgamesh did as he was told, though he could not tell why exactly they should need twelve poles of wood. He discovered soon enough, putting out to sea along the pathways left by the sinking sun, thinking every moment to tumble over the edge of the world, Gilgamesh was obliged to punt. One pole was long enough for a while to touch bottom, but soon two screwed together end to end were not long enough. He screwed on a third and a fourth, feeling the tip far below skid and skip over... What? The hulls of sunken ships? The shells of sleeping turtles? The skulls of drowned men? The scales of sea monsters? Soon six rods were not enough. Sometime during the night they crossed into a sea lane which thrummed and raced under the hull, making the boat roll and yaw till Gilgamesh was as green as a snake. Don't let your hands touch the water, warned Urshanabi, and Gilgamesh knew that they were crossing the river of death. Not seven or eight rods, not nine or ten were enough to touch the bottom of this deepest ocean trench. Gilgamesh screwed on the eleventh, and then the very last rod he had cut from the seaside forest. But Urshanabi had miscalculated. It's not enough, he told the ferryman. The fast sea current was starting to carry the boat off course. What would happen if he was forced to push his hand and wrists into the waves in order to touch bottom? Would the oily darkness seize on him like tar, or wash the life out of him through the palms of his blistered hands? Then he thought of the mast. 
But without a sail, how shall we break free of the current? Urshanabi protested as Gilgamesh hacked down the mast. I shall be the mast, said Gilgamesh. Using the mast for a thirteenth rod, their punt pole was at last long enough to touch bottom, and Gilgamesh was able to punt on across the river of death, his hand staying clear of the water. Then Urshanabi took the punt pole, and Gilgamesh put on Urshanabi's shirt. His body was so wasted and thin that it flapped around him like a shroud. He stood amidships, arms stretched out to either side, and the west wind filled the shirt which bellied out ahead of him. He thought he must be carried away by the wind, blown into the sky among the wheeling seagulls. It can't be done, you know, Urshanabi called over his shoulder, casual, matter of fact. The gods never meant people to live forever. Not your friend, not you, not me. You can ask Utnapishtim, but he'll tell you the same. You should stop fretting about death and settle for a good life. Do things you can look back on with pride. Make your mark on the world by all means, but then pass the baton to the next runner. That's the way of the world. Run with the baton, then pass it on. The boat slowed. Urshanabi turned and saw that Gilgamesh was no longer holding his arms at full stretch, but had his fingers in his ears so as to not hear the ferryman's talk of giving up. Chapter 8 Far Away What would he be like, Utna pished him, whom the gods had rewarded with eternal life? Would he look like Enkidu, thick-set and shaggy? Would he stand larger than life, skin radiating life like the zest from a lemon. As Gilgamesh stood, arms outstretched, catching the wind in Urshanabi's shirt, he saw the shore coming closer, and on it all manner of wonderful sights. A lion sleeping while a fawn calmly cropped grass within the circle of its paws, a wolf playing alongside a lamb. The air was full of the sound of wood pigeons crooning, and doves sat in heart-shaped pairs on leafy trees. No snow ever falls here, said Urshanabi, the ferryman. The animals live in perfect peace. There's no death for ravens to gloat over. On Paradise Shore, only the hours and the years died imperceptibly, molting like feathers from a swan's back. Then Gilgamesh caught sight of a middle-aged couple sitting together under a halib tree, he in a hammock cracking nuts, she busy brushing a little white goat. At the approach of the boat, the man in the hammock shielded his eyes to look. He had large, sticking-out ears, a thin neck, and protruding teeth. "'There he is, man of Yurik,' said the ferryman. "'Not that he will tell you anything different from what I've said.' Gilgamesh could hardly believe his ears. "'This is Utnapishtim the Immortal? The far away? Leaping ashore, he went and stood openly staring at the old man in the hammock. He must have looked very menacing, but the man in the hammock did not stir. He simply asked, Who are you? I am Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, he declared, bracing his shoulders, jutting his chin. My word, said the man, looking less than impressed. The burdens of kingship must be great these days. Why so haggard and ragged, as if you had seen all the sufferings of the world? Because I have, said Gilgamesh. I've crossed the desert, scorched by the sun and flayed by frost, traveled through twelve leagues of utter darkness, punted my way across the river of death, and I have grieved, too. My friend Enkidu died, and I've sworn never to suffer the same fate. That's why I've come, to learn the secret of immortality from the one man who has it. I thought you would be more... more... More what? Utnapishtim smiled, amused by Gilgamesh's bewilderment. More full of life, raging and racketing about, wrestling wild beasts to their knees, slaying giants. Yes, yes, yes. Without realizing it, Gilgamesh sat down on the ground, the fatigue of his journey suddenly overwhelming him. Utnapishtim's wife brought him a drink of wine. Why, where's the hurry? What do I have to prove? When a man has only few years of life, he feels he must pack them full. Say you were given a small trunk and told, you can carry away with you only as much as you can fit in here. Then naturally you would cram it full, wouldn't you? Me, I have all the time in the world. Time is not standing at my back with his whip, 
making me dance, making me run, making me strive. I've had time to learn the important things are few. A wife, contentment, memories, peace. You should not have put yourself to the trouble of coming all this way, he said at length. It is your fate to live and then to die, just as it was mine to live forever. Ah, but I slew Huawa, boasted Gilgamesh, and the bull of heaven. On my way here I slew a whole pride of lions. Utnapishtim nodded, less impressed than Gilgamesh would have hoped. Might I venture to suggest, he said, that the gods would prefer their works of creation alive rather than dead. Tell me, said Gilgamesh tersely, tell me how you came to be immortal. And while he listened, he was thinking, at the back of his mind, what can this man do that I can't? When Enlil began creating the world, said Utnapishtim, his workmen were his fellow gods, Anu, and Ea, and Wei'e, and Nergal. But long before the last riverbed was dug, the gods threw down their spades and pickaxes and refused to do another stroke. Then Wei'e came up with a solution. They ought to create some kind of creature to complete the work. Thus human beings were created. They were ideal. When they could not work any more, they died. But there were still enough, because they reproduced themselves at such a rate. Soon cities grew up, swarming like ant hills with industrious little people. The only snag was the noise they made. All day long they quarreled and laughed, bartered goods in the markets, sang or made speeches. They left their babies out in the sunshine, and the mewling and shrieking was more than Enlil could stand. What is that noise? demanded Enlil. It's the people, said Ea. Busy little things, aren't they? Thin them out, hissed Enlil, nerves frayed from lack of sleep. Send plague to prune the noisiest. Ea did as he was told, but he had grown fond of humankind and hurried off ahead of plague to warn them. When plague arrived, the cities of Earth were silent as mirages the citizens moving about their business wordlessly, the market traders miming, the babies' mouths plugged up with honeycomb. And while they remained silent, Enlil was content to let them live. But as time passed, of course, as generations came and went, the noise built up again, nagging and squabbling and cheering. Silence their caterwauling! yelled Enlil out of the windows of heaven. Send drought and famine! Perhaps when they are dead of thirst and starvation, these humans will finally be quiet. Well, Ea did as he was told, but hurried ahead to warn the people of Earth. Once again, the cities fell silent. Once again, Enlil relented and drought and famine withdrew. But as time passed, of course, the noise built up again. Wars and fairs, circuses and parades, building sites and forges... Enlil slammed shut the windows of heaven, but it hardly made a difference. I will not have this din! Drown the whole pack of them! he bawled. And this time he summoned all his brothers and sister gods, and made them all consent to the destruction of mankind. And this time not a word to a soul, not a single soul. Agreed? Shamash bowed his head in consent. Anu grunted and put his fingers in his ears. Even Nergal, who had shaped mankind, agreed. Even Ishtar, goddess of love. Ea, too, gave his consent, though in his heart he was trying to think of some way to rescue the situation. There might just be time to deliver a single message. Utnapishtim broke off from his story. Seven generations ago, Shurapak was my city. I was king there. The god Ea has always been esteemed highly in Shurapak for his gentleness towards mankind, and I venture to think that he and I were on good terms. Ea wanted to warn me, but because of his vow could not speak to me directly. So he whispered into the fabric of my house, do you see? The reeds of which its walls were made. Reed house, reed house, listen and pray. Would that your walls were torn down today, and from your reeds were built a craft, a huge pitch-covered roofed-in raft, as tall as she's long, as wide as she's square. 
that those who board her might then be spared. The doom the gods have ordained for mankind, a flood which once come will leave nothing behind. Do not sleep, keep watch, keep awake, or the thread of life will forever break. That night when the wind blew on my house, the reeds whispered Ea's words to me as I slept, and I dreamt what I had to do. Save all of nature from Enlil's damnation. I told the people of Shurapak that I had been summoned to sail to the underworld to pay for my sins, and that's why I was building a boat. How could I tell them the truth? Workmen are easy enough to come by as well. I just offered unlimited supplies of roast meat and rough wine. In a week I had a boat. It had seven decks in all, each one divided into nine sections by bulkheads to keep the various animals apart. You can't put gazelles in with lions. I mean, you couldn't in those days. I made the reeds watertight with a mixture of melted pitch, oil, and asphalt. It was big, unimaginably big. It covered an acre of ground, and each side of the deck was 120 cubits long. A cube, in fact. Not a seaworthy shape. Not an easy shape to launch. We had to keep shifting the ballast about until she would float two-thirds under water, stable enough not to turn turtle. I loaded aboard my family, my animals. I took one male and one female of every species, so that afterwards, after the catastrophe, they would be able to reproduce and replenish the earth. I mean, what would the earth be without its animals and birds? In the evening, the rain began. Never seen weather like it. It turned the ground to slurry in an instant. So I went aboard myself, slithering and sliding on the mud slick round the boat, climbing the scaffolding and batten down the last open hatch over my head. It was dark. Only the hissing of the rain on the reeds and tar, as if all the waterfalls of heaven were falling on our heads. But that was nothing. At dawn, the lord of the storm summoned up a black cloud that smothered the whole plain of Shular and Hanish. Water seemed to well up from the ground, from the abyss under the earth. The goddess of the underworld smashed all her dams and let it come fountaining up. The seven judges of hell came roaming through the land, torches held aloft, so that the sky outside was permanently lit by an eerie flicker. Great rods of lightning wedged between heaven and earth. That storm smashed the land like a cup. The boat was soon riding floodwaters through city and plain and forest. I had to stay at my tiller every moment, or we could have foundered against a drowning palace or snagged on the branches of some tree. I could not afford to sleep. I could see now why Ea had forbidden me to sleep. For a whole day the storm trampled the world. You could hear people calling out, unable to find one another, for the walls of rain. As the rain beat on them, they all began to turn back to clay, to the substance they were made from. And how can you sleep while that happens? Even the gods were afraid. They climbed up to the highest chambers of heaven, the floodwaters cornering them like cringing dogs against the walls. You could hear the goddess Ishtar howling with remorse because she had gone along with Enlil's damnation of mankind. Aren't they my people? Didn't I help to give them life? Now look at them, floating in the ocean like so much fish spawn. She wasn't alone in grieving. All the great gods of heaven and hell put their hands over their mouths and wept at what they had done. For six days and nights the storm went on, and not for one moment did I close my eyes or sleep. Even when every animal and every child and every star seemed to be asleep, I stayed awake, my hand on the tiller, praying for deliverance. When the drumming of the rain finally stopped on the seventh day, I threw open a hatch, and a bolt of sunlight fell in my face like a bale of yellow hay. I looked out from my ark, and what did I see? Nothing. There was nothing to see. Nothing in any direction but water flat as any rooftop. I don't have to tell you. I sat down and wept. I lay down and cried like a child. The whole of mankind turned to clay. 
the whole of nature reduced to a slick of red dust under countless fathoms of water. My head was stuffed with sleep. I was reeling with weariness. I didn't know whether to believe my eyes or not, but it seemed to me that about fourteen leagues away there was an island. I blinked and bleared at it. Yes, a bare mountain tip was sticking up out of the water. I won't say I steered for it. We were drifting towards it, willy-nilly, and there we wedged. For seven days we sat wedged on that mountain top, while the flotsam of a lost world drifted by us. Dolls, dishes, gates, wheels, bottles. On the seventh day, I brought up a dove up on deck and let her go. She flew away, but clearly there was nowhere for her to perch because she came back. The next day I loosed a swallow. She flew away too, but the land was still drowned, because back she came. On the third day I loosed a raven. She circled slowly, blackly into the sunny sky, then flew off. She didn't come back. That's when I knew it was safe to open up every hatch and free the animals from below decks. They lumbered out past me, leaving behind a litter of feathers and fur and a stench I won't even try to describe. I watched them straying further and further from the ark as the mountainside gradually emerged, steaming from under the shrinking floodwaters. I was easily visible from heaven, easily picked off if Enlil was still bent on destroying the entire human race. So I took fourteen cauldrons of oil and set them up on the mountainside, lit fires under them of the sweetest smelling wood I could forage. As the fumes went up from those cauldrons, the whole dome of the sky was filled with the sweetest smell imaginable. The gods were drawn to it, like flies to honey, like shark to blood. They couldn't keep away. Snuffling up the sweet smoke, they came sighing and swimming through the rain-washed air. Last of all came Ishtar, lovely Ishtar, wearing a necklace of jewels that were every color ever given a name. Red, amber, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. When she saw that the flood was over, she lifted it over her head and threw it into the sky, swearing, I shall remember these days, but the jewels of my throat I shall never forget. She had, had invented the rainbow, you see. Enil came, of course. When he saw my boat, oh, I thought he would smash it with a single thunderbolt. What? he yelled. Has one of them escaped? Who warned him? I cowered down under a corner of the ark, with my head between my knees, hands over my ears. But then I heard my friend's voice. Ea was speaking up for me, reasoning with Enlil. Punish people when they sin, by all means, but don't destroy them utterly. Where would we be without mortals to dig and tend the earth, to press the oil for our sacrifices, to build the temple for our worship? Do you think we'll take up our tools again in labor and sweat? Think again. Why create the earth at all, if it is only to stand empty like some house on a hill, its doors banging in the wind? I didn't tell the man Utna pished him about the coming of the flood. He had the wisdom to dream it. For seven days and seven nights he kept awake, steering the ark safely through the waves. Should such a man die? I had crawled out of my hiding to listen. When Enlil turned and saw me, it was too late to duck out of sight again, so I stood up. He ordered me and my wife to go aboard the ark. With trembling knees we went up the gangplank again, and knelt down on the utmost deck. Up came Enlil, closer and closer, reaching out his hands. Then, just when I thought I would die of fear, he took both Saba and I by the hand and stood between us. He touched our foreheads and said, Live forever, man of Shurapak. Make your home on Paradise Shore, beyond the River of Death, and live forever as we gods do. Chapter 9 The Bread of Sorrow Your eyelids are heavy, King of Yurik. How long since you slept? Gilgamesh gave a start. A day? Two days, perhaps? If only the gods would test me like that. Utnapishtim exchanged a smile with his wife. No need. I will set you a test. I don't pride myself on what I did. I had no choice, and the gods helped me. But could you stay awake seven days and seven nights if lives depended on it? Of course. 
said Gilgamesh, jumping to his feet. So Gilgamesh stood on Paradise Shore, eyes wide, despite their red rims. What was so hard about defeating sleep, after all? Did it have claws or horns or fangs? Did it come wearing armor? No. Sleep was soft and wool-lined. Sleep came swirling and silken, rolling over a man like fog. The sea whispered behind Gilgamesh. The ropes of the hammock creaked in the tree. Gilgamesh sat down again and rested his eyes for a moment. Weary? He had never been weary as a young man. How long ago was that? When was it that that young man had paced about his palace too full of energy to sleep? Not so very long, surely. Was old age already battening on him like a vampire bat, draining him of energy? For a moment he thought he saw it bearing down on him, and opened his eyes in fright. But it was only the awning flapping, flapping in the sea-whispering breeze. Wife, said Utnapishtim, as Gilgamesh slumped sideways under the soundest of sleeps, Go and cook a loaf and set it down by our guest for him to eat when he wakes. He won't wake for a week, poor weary soul, said Saba. I know that, said Utnapishtim, but bake it anyway. Every morning, Saba baked a loaf of bread and set it by Gilgamesh where he slept on the seashore. They lay like seven pillows beside the sleeping king of Uruk. When at last he stirred, his opening eyes struggled to focus. The next moment he was on his feet, swaying slightly with dizziness. "'That was a great sleep, Gilgamesh,' said Utnapishtim. "'A great sleep born out of a great weariness.' "'Sleep? Me? No, no. I just nodded for a moment. Not asleep. I wasn't asleep. "'For seven days and seven nights you slept, my friend. Never. What do you take me for, a fool?' Each day I had my wife bake a loaf. Look, there they are. You can see how old they are. The first is green with mold. The last is still warm. In between are all the stages a loaf goes through before it ceases to be a loaf. A little like the life of man, wouldn't you say? Sweet-smelling and softly tender at first. Harder with age. A harder outer crust to defend a man against life's knocks. Little by little, more and more brittle, then at last, decay. Which loaf of bread are you, I wonder? Gilgamesh's reply was to kick the oldest and most mildewed loaf out to sea. It exploded into dust around his foot. He had failed the challenge. His weary, aging body had let him down. He had failed, and failure was a very bitter bread indeed for a man like Gilgamesh to eat. Sit down! "'Breakfast, my friend,' said Utnapishtim. "'My wife bakes very good bread, "'and what more does a man need to be happy "'than a loaf of bread, a jug of wine, and good company? "'Give up your quest. "'The gods never meant you to live forever, "'so why spoil the life they did give you? "'Is the rainbow any less beautiful because it's short-lived, "'or because you can't grasp hold of it? "'Consider, man. "'Perhaps it is beautiful expressly because of that.' But Gilgamesh was not listening. His heart had turned to mold like that first made loaf. All his dreams had exploded into dust. He knelt in the sand and wept, banging his forehead on the ground, tasting his own salt tears run in at the corners of his mouth like spray from the river of death. Urshanabi had brought his fairy close into the beach to see if he could glimpse Gilgamesh. The faraway was angry. Ferryman, you were wrong to bring this man here. Take him away, and take yourself off, too. Have you not broken your promise to Shamash by bringing him here? You have forfeited your right to sail on the service of the immortals. Urshanabi meekly bowed his head in apology, accepting his banishment from Paradise Shore. He helped Gilgamesh aboard and put out to sea again. The mast was mended now. A new sail caught the warm wind. Gilgamesh sat huddled in the stern, still weeping. "'I feel so sorry for the man,' said Saba, standing in the circle of her husband's arm. "'He is so very, very afraid. My heart bleeds for him.' Overhearing her words, Gilgamesh shuddered with shame. "'Am I a god? Could I have granted him immortality?' her husband asked in reply. 
You could have told him about Old Man Young. It's not immortality, but it would have been something. Something in return for all his sufferings. Utnapishtim shook his head. Already he has exhausted his youth and strength on this foolish quest. It would be too great an ordeal. Too terrible. I like him too much. You. Too much for what? Who is old made young? Gilgamesh, hearing the conversation, had grabbed the helm out of Urshanabi's hands, turned the boat about, and run it ashore again. Now he had hold of Utnapishtim. What did she mean? Tell me. Old man young, old man young, cried Utnapishtim. Calmly, man, put me down. It is the name of a plant. Must you go looking for disappointment even at the bottom of the sea? Is that where it grows? What does it look like? What does it do? How will I find it? Tell me. Tell me everything. And so Utnapishtim told Gilgamesh about Old Man Young, a single weed growing offshore, protected by ripping currents and armed with thorns so sharp that even the crabs could not slice it through with their armored claws. Grip it tight and fetch it up to the light, and it has magic enough to make a hundred old men young again, said Utnapishtim. But whereas there had been friendship in his eyes before, there was a faraway look now, a saddened vexation at Gilgamesh's lack of manners, gratitude, and kingly dignity. Chapter 10. The Plant of Life I shan't use it first myself, Gilgamesh told the ferryman. He sat on the sluice gates, tying rocks to his ankles with cords from the ferry's rigging. I shall give it to the old men of Uruk, and see them grow young again before my eyes. Imagine! All the wisdom of old age in the body of a young man. Uruk will be the greatest city on all the plains of the world. The rock scraped the skin from his ankle bones, but he barely noticed. So intent was he on finding the prickly plant. At the mouth of the nearby river stood a reservoir of fresh water. You must lift the sluice gates and let out the rush of water carry you to sea, said the ferryman. Those rocks will keep you from bobbing up to the surface too soon. He would have to hold his breath all the time. He was not a swimming sort of man, and envied how the little boys he had seen in Uruk leaping into the Euphrates for the sheer fun of it. The sluice gates were hard to lift, but suddenly the pent-up water inside was surging out to sea. Filling his lungs so full he felt them bulge through his ribs, Gilgamesh dropped off the gate and into the racing torrent. The cold clamped round his ribs and forced out half the air he had breathed in. The current turned him over and over. The rocks tied his ankles banging about him, bruising his head and body and legs. He no longer knew which way up he was, which way to struggle for air. He opened his clenched eyes and saw only the swirling sand and the bubbles jarred from his own nose and mouth. He peered ahead, hand clapped over nose and mouth, trying to keep the air in his chest. Gradually the water became clear, the current behind him weakening. Then the tide rip struck him like a battering ram. And there it was, on the seabed, a dark green snaggle of leaves and spiky stalks. Not another plant grew in the strong current. Only this plant was too well rooted to be dislodged. He would have only one chance. If he failed to grasp the plant, he would be swept on by it and lose it forever. He scuffed his feet, elbows, knees against the seabed in an attempt to slow down, then reached out and grabbed the plant with both fists. It was nettle and briar and cactus in one. The pain was so intense that he thought the plant must be on fire, his hands burning. He opened his mouth to yell, and the sea rushed in. But he did not let go. He fumbled left-handed at the knots, tying the rocks to his ankles. They were swollen, impacted, and would not undo. They would hold him down below water, while the breath in his lungs dissolved as he drowned. High above him, the sunny surface was a myriad golden gules, shimmering and shoaling. He picked up one of the rocks and sliced at the rope with it, all the while holding fast to the fabulous plant with its bristles and spines and venomous hairs. His lungs flattened inside him like goat-skin flagons, emptied of wine. Blackness ringed his vision. If he let go, he might yet live. 
Then one foot was free, and the loop of the second was slipping over his heel. He set both feet to the seabed, pushed with all his might, and wrenched the plant out of the ocean floor. He was not sure how he reached the surface. His whole head, his very lungs, seemed to be filled with seawater. And yet he burst through, brandishing the plant high above his head. Choking and sputtering, he instantly began to kick his legs and dragged the water aside with his left hand. But his right kept tight hold of the blazing agony, the precious weed that would restore his youth and the youth of all the old men of Uruk. His sense of triumph was immense. Not since Enkidu fought at his side, not since the bull of heaven had crashed to earth at his feet, had Gilgamesh felt a joy like it. Like red-hot needles, the plant's bristling spines pierced and cut his palm. But he could bear any amount of pain. The fear which had cramped in his stomach ever since Enkidu's death was gone at last. Not immortal, perhaps, but young again and full of vigor, Gilgamesh would soon feel life course through him like meltwater down a dried-up riverbed. He would have time and strength enough to do such deeds as would make the gods relent and say, Look! Look at this Gilgamesh! Shall such a man die? Never. Gilgamesh trod water. The waves shouldered and shoved him. He could not see the shore. He had used up all his strength in picking the plant. What if the current was sweeping him out to sea? What if it washed him out as far as the river of death? What good would the plant be to him then? Then he rolled over and to his inexpressible joy saw a snake-headed prow rearing up out of a golden bow wave. As Urshanabi pulled him aboard, Gilgamesh prattled and babbled like a little boy. He whirled Urshanabi about in a wild, wet dance, and Urshanabi laughed and struggled, nodded and danced. He had grown fond of the impetuous king of Uruk. Suddenly Gilgamesh wanted very much to be home in Uruk, to tell his mother to see his shady rooms again, to know how the rebuilding work was progressing. He should not have left his people in a time of drought. Was there any way for the father of his people to behave? Suddenly he stopped dancing. Urshanabi, what have I done to you? I've robbed you of your livelihood. I put you out of favor with the gods. Urshanabi shrugged. Come home with me, Urshanabi. Come back to Uruk. The Euphrates is no sea, but at least the spray of it can't kill you. Come with me. There's no place in the world like Uruk. As the two men sailed back over the ocean, the seawater dried on Gilgamesh and left him salt-caked and uncomfortable. Brown blood caked his hands and arms from where he had grasped the plant, and his hair was seeded with saltwater prawns. He felt less like a king than a sardine drying in the sun. After they had walked thirty leagues, he spotted a deep, cool lake and decided to bathe. He set the plant down on a flat rock and immersed himself in the cool water. His gray hair spread out around his face as he floated on his back, looking up at the sky. Soon he would be wearing linen again and eating stoned olives and taking a glass of wine on the sill of his room in the Yurik Palace. He would offer up sacrifices, making things right with the gods. He would ask their blessing on the people of his city, then summon the masons to carve this latest adventure on the bare wall. The fights, the victories, the achievements. He would give Urshanabi some post in government as compensation for what he had lost. Poor man, to think I had caused his banishment. He thought of Suduri, the wine cellar on the seashore, and how pleased she had been when he called on his return journey to show her the plant. Even so, she had repeated her advice. Take a wife. You think this bit of greenery makes you happy? It's nothing in comparison with a child. The cool, clean water crept in at his ears and the corners of his mouth and eyes. He was very happy. There were good people in the world, more than he had thought. Glancing toward the rock, he saw the green plant, a tatter of thorns and spines. He saw the snake, too, of no great size, just a common snake. It slithered out of a crevice, tasting a peculiar scent on the air with its quivering forked tongue. No! It crossed the rock in a twinkling, unhinged its jaws, and swallowed the plant, insensitive to pain. No, no, no! At once its dull mantle of scales split from end to end, and a new snake emerged, shining and brightly colored. 
Then it was gone, leaving behind the transparent husk of its sloughed skin, leaving behind its old age. Not a stem, not a leaf, not a bristle or a thorn remained of the plant called Old Man Young, and all its magic, every twinkle and shimmer, was gone too, down into the snake's belly. Chapter 11 Home Gilgamesh knelt on the bank of the pool, vomiting his misery in great retching sobs. He beat his torn fists on the ground and howled like a wild animal. All gone, Urshanabi! What was it all for? All those weeks! All that suffering and pain! What am I? Nobody! Some sick old man with nothing to show for it but tears! Oh, I wouldn't say... Urshanabi murmured comfort, but Gilgamesh was deaf to anything but his own lament. They traveled back through the Garden of the Gods, gathering up gemstones like so many fallen petals from under the flower bushes. They stumbled back to the Mashu Mountain. Somehow it was not so dark for two. Besides, the darkness inside Gilgamesh was ten times as black. They traveled back to the gates of Shamash, where the Scorpion Guard stared at them in astonishment. They traveled back to the mountain pass where the lions had prowled. There seemed to be just as many as before, but now Gilgamesh was startled by their beauty. Their hides suited him better than they had hid him. He did not want to slaughter them. They would soon be enough dead, bereft of their lithe, elegant beauty. "'Tell me about Yurik, said Urshanabi, and Gilgamesh found he was eager to do so. "'The city is one part field, one part town,' one part gardens. Then there are the temples, of course, wonders of the world. The water from the river is ducked into the city, threads of silver everywhere, like wire in a tapestry. The wall is high and curved. The foundations were laid in the days of the seven sages. Even when the bull of heaven stamped, those walls stayed standing. Urshanabi listened without interrupting. My builders are the best. My masons take pride in their work, and my gardeners are skilled at grafting and pruning. I wonder you ever left such a place, Urshanabi remarked mildly. So too did Gilgamesh when he saw Yurik. Each familiar roof and tower and window was like the features of a well-loved face. The perfumes of his childhood came to the gate to meet him. At least he had lived to see it all again. As he walked through the streets, people idly looked up at those two grubby strangers. A murmur of excitement built up in their wake. Can it be? It can't be. The king, you mean? Never. He's long dead, surely. Come and see. Go and tell the children. Look, look. Gilgamesh the Mighty has come home. Where are the banners? See how white his hair. Where has he been? An inexpressible tenderness filled Gilgamesh. After being in lonely, distant places, it was good to see so many familiar faces. After the brown of the stony wilderness, the black of the mountain's interior, he wondered at the multi-colors of the city. He had forgotten how many flowers there were, how the awnings and drying washing added to the gold of masonry, the red of the terracotta. He had forgotten all the noises, too. Women singing, dogs barking, chickens cackling, donkeys braying, the vendors shouting their wares. Only the sound of building had fallen quiet, with no one to order new towers or temples. A woman's voice drifted from a window. Worst news I've heard. Must we go back to war and work? She came to her window and looked out, straight into the face of the king. Her eyes, already fearful, widened into terror as she realized he had heard her. She feared for her life. Gilgamesh returned her a smile, an awkward, grimacing smile, realizing how rarely he had ever smiled before. At his shoulder, the ferryman stood gazing about him. Well, Urshanabi, didn't I tell you it was the finest city in the world? Urshanabi smiled and nodded. At last, Gilgamesh's tour of the city brought them to the carved friezes depicting the deeds of the past heroes. There was Utnapishtim, his odd cube-shaped ark wedged on a mountaintop. There were the seven sages, and there were Enkidu and Gilgamesh bringing home the tallest tree from the cedar forest to build new gates for Yurik. "'And this, I take it, is Enkidu,' said the ferryman. 
Gilgamesh had left Yurik before the scene was carved. At first he could not bear to look. Then he could not stop looking. His hand reached out towards the figure, carved high up, far larger than life, in bas relief. His fingers came to rest on the ankle of Enkidu. I came back, friend. Just as I was, but I came back. Urshanabi saw that his eyes were full of tears. The ferryman smiled and shook his head. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Chapter 12 The Twelfth Tablet The skies over Yurik were smoky as the king's sacrifices burned. Meat and fruit, oil and flowers. The gods were drawn like flies to circle in the perfumed air. After fulfilling his duty to the gods, Gilgamesh sent for his masons. The people groaned. Now the building would begin again. Soon it would be the wars. But Gilgamesh was too wary for battle campaigns. Since destroying the steering gear of the ferry boat, he thought twice about destroying things. Fearing death, he no longer wished it on the young men of his city. Exhausted, he no longer wanted anyone to work themselves into an early grave. He did not want anyone to mourn as he had mourned for Enkidu. He looked at the old men and felt responsible for their frailty. But he did send for his masons and scribes. He told them to carve his adventures on the Wall of Heroes and write them on clay tablets for future generations to read. While he told them his story, they listened like children at his feet, open-mouthed, fingers in the air, astounded. They ran home and told their wives and children, and soon the city buzzed with voices retelling the epic of Gilgamesh. What a story it was! The king's dreams reenacted his adventures. Sometimes he woke crying, sometimes screaming, and sometimes he even woke up laughing. Through his window he heard the people say, He has changed! How he has changed! But how could that be? He had not gained immortality. He had not eaten the prickly plant. Surely it was they who had changed. Once they had hated him, and now, for some reason, they loved him. When the frieze was finished, he went to look at it. But tell me, why this empty panel at the end? Do you think I will be going on more journeys? asked Gilgamesh wryly. No, sire, but begging your pardon, sire, that panel is to show your funeral. Gilgamesh rocked as if he had been struck. He returned to the palace and asked to see what his scribe poets had written. They brought him eleven tablets. "'I suppose you realize this is incomplete,' he said, his voice harsh and rasping. "'You have not recounted my death.' The scribes bowed low. "'Naturally there will be a twelfth tablet, my lord king.' At last, Gilgamesh took to heart the advice of Siduri, the wine cellar. He did marry, and he did have children." On the day his first son was born, he took the child in his arms and stood on the broad sill of his room overlooking a Yurik golden in the evening sun. Tears ran down his cheek now as freely as the day his friend had died. But today he was crying tears of joy. For was he not holding new life in his arms? And did it not have his eyes and his hands and his long feet and his Sumerian nose? Was he not as immortal now as every other father of sons? The child's hands within his own were as small as the seed of a cedar tree. He called the child Prince Enkidu. Out of the darkness of sleep a dream hurtled down, a meteor trailing a tail of light and an axe lying in the street. The meteor was fame, the axe his fate. They were heavy to carry, but no one else would have even tried to pick them up. As it was... Gilgamesh did such things, dared so much, learned such wisdom, conquered such fear that his name outlived the gods themselves. Long after Enlil and Anu, Ishtar, Ea, and Shamash had been forgotten on the plain of two rivers, the fame of Gilgamesh lived on. He was Gilgamesh the mortal, Gilgamesh the friend, Gilgamesh the father, Gilgamesh the hero, Gilgamesh the coward, Gilgamesh the wise man. Gilgamesh the Fool. Everyone wants to leave their mark on the world, and he left a mark as big as a meteor crashing to earth. As they carved on the twelfth tablet, he walked through darkness, and so glimpsed the light. <laughs>